Hello and welcome to Lion Wing Talks, a weekly show where we discuss all things Lion Wing, tabletop games, Japanese games, and localization. I'm your host, Bradley Hailstorm, founder and president of Lion Wing. This is episode 17. We got a lot to talk about tonight. So not only do we have a lot to talk about with community submitted questions, of which we have almost two dozen of, uh, but we've got a lot of project updates. Some exciting news, some not so exciting news, and probably some news in between, I'm sure. N what I'm trying to say is I'm going to be talking a lot tonight. Now, I will not be talking for two hours tonight. That much I can guarantee. Episode uh, 16 was quite the lengthy episode, so lengthy that, you know, as, as I was sitting there uploading the video to YouTube, I was thinking, all right, what am I going to call this thing? You know, I've always got to have some kind of episode name, which, by the way, I regret doing. I should have just kept them at, like, episode one, two, three, four, and gave them no subtitles because I hate coming up with episode names. But last week's name sort of came naturally as I was uploading the video, and I thought, well, what can I call this one? And I looked down at the runtime, and I'm like, oh, this video is like an hour and 56 minutes. Um, I'm just going to call it two hours. That'll do. Uh, cause we've never had a show run that long. I've joked around before about like the show running 90 minutes, 95 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes, but we've never gotten to two hours. So that was pretty impressive. Episode 17, this episode tonight will not be that long. We did not get 40 questions this week. Uh, however, I would say of the 40 questions last week, only like 20 to 22 of those were, were actually relevant. The others were fun and silly and fun to answer, but weren't necessarily uh, applicable to line wing stuff. This week, we have half the number of questions we had last week, but I think we have a lot less of those uh, silly questions this week. So it probably balances out, even though it's far more impressive to say we've got 40 questions to answer than 20. But, eh, you know, quality over quantity this week, I think, is the name of the game. So without any further ado, let's see who's in the chat here. All right. So we got some, we got some folks here that I'm used to seeing. Thanks everyone for joining us. As always, if you've got a question for me, drop it in the chat. I will answer it in real time. It's my favorite thing to do. That being said, we are going to jump into the listener submitted questions. Now, the first one is, is a little silly and doesn't really have anything to do with line wink, but I missed it last week. And so I promised the the individual in the Discord who submitted this question that I would definitely get to it this week. I see Fry Guy Fern is in the chat, and he said quality over quantity is the title of today's episode 100%. You know what, Fern? I think you're right. Uh, if you're not aware, Fern is our Operation Bulletstorm winner. So this past Sunday, we had the official top eight players of Western Gun and Gun square off in what we are calling week two, the final week, the, the bracketed tournament of our week-long round-robin uh, gun-and-gun event called Operation Bulletstorm. So Operation Bulletstorm was our first inaugural gun-and-gun uh, -gun tournament, but really it was our first tournament ever for Lion Wing. We had never run a tournament before Sunday, and Fern is our champion. I'll talk more about that in the gun-and-gun -gun updates, of which I have plenty to talk about. So question number one today, what is your or entire squad's greatest slash funniest achievement in an apex match. So this individual must have seen at some point in the discord, I mentioned that I like apex a lot. Now I don't get to play apex as much right now as I did um, initially, just because there are so many projects going on that I don't have a lot of time. And to be honest, the video game time that I do have currently, I'm dedicating to trying to get through resident evil village and then um, playing some retro stuff. So I haven't played a lot of Apex, though I do make sure that I sneak in some Apex, um, you know, a couple times a month here and there. So I don't know if I could identify my greatest or my funniest achievement. Those, I like, I'm never good with identifying those types of things, but I can say that something happened within the past four weeks that was quite fantastic. And so that story is, I'll keep it short, um, my squad and I, we were dropping in. Uh, we dropped into uh, a pretty hot spot. I wasn't the uh, the the party leader on that one, so I was just kind of going with the flow. And it was a it was a pug, so like I wasn't playing with anyone that I knew. And uh, so we dropped in. 
uh, three other teams dropped in with us. We were caught in the middle of, of a firefight because somehow all three teams managed to find weapons. We did not, lucky us. Um, so we dropped in the middle of them. They were shooting at each other. We were caught in the crossfire like, oh shit, what, what do we do? So my two teammates go down. I'm like running around trying to stay alive. I'm, I'm assuming like, oh yeah, like this is it. This is it for me. This is going to be a quick match. We're going to be bumped back to the lobby. I'm going to be get, joining another game. Anyway, so I, I make it out of the firefight somehow. I don't even know how. I, I, I found a weapon. Um, ended up flanking one of the groups. They were all kind of spread out, occupied with trying to take out these other, uh, I guess, two teams. Though at that point, I think they had taken out one of the other teams. So it was just like a, a, a one team versus another team. I went behind them, cleaned up those folks, went and got up, got my folks, got out of there. We didn't win the match, but we did. I, I think we were the third squad left. So not like the greatest achievement, but it was still one of those moments where I dropped in. I was like, this is it. This is going to be a quick match. And then uh, we really ended up turning it around. And that's always kind of an achievement when you're playing with a bunch of people you don't know and you're not talking the entire time. So that was pretty cool. Um, what retro games uh, said Silent Frank in the chat? So right now I am playing Albert Odyssey for the Sega Saturn um, as well as Shining Force 3 for the Sega Saturn. That's what I'm playing currently. I just recently got uh, a new HDMI hookup for my Sega Saturn, so I've been um, I've been more interested in in playing some Sega Saturn games right now. That way, I'm not having to go through my composite my composite cords um, and stretching the the image to uh, a resolution that looks like absolute trash. Not to say that this HDMI uh, hookup is the best HDMI hookup out there. It's just one of the um, one of the hookups from pound, but for like 28 bucks, it's doing the trick quite well. The colors are super vibrant. Uh, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen shining forest three look so good. And I love that it maintains the four by three, uh, aspect ratio instead of stretching the picture. So, um, I think I've mentioned this before, depending on the day that you catch me, I'll say this Sega Saturn is my favorite console. Other times I'll say it's the dreamcast as the shirt implies. But uh, I really do like the RPG offerings on the Saturn. Not a ton, but every RPG on the Saturn is good. Every RPG on the Saturn is good. Not like most, not like 90% of them. I mean 100% of them, uh, which is why I love the Saturn. I wish we would have been able to get more RPGs because Japan got a ton. Like Wackenroder. But all right, I digress. Let's get back to these questions. Question two, how did the original Lion Wing team come together? Was it a group of friends uh, or did you go straight to industry contacts to build a team? Yeah, so prior to Lion Wing, I was working with uh, four people that you've probably seen in the credits of most of our games. So prior to Lion Wing, I've mentioned that I was working on my own tabletop game. Some stuff happened. I ended up kind of putting that on putting that on hold and then moving into localization of, of tabletop games. But prior to that, I was working on my own game. I had uh, recruited some folks uh, from my own friend circle to help with that. Uh, our graphic designer who was featured on episode 2.5 of the show, Tyler, who was also the graphic designer on both Embryo Machine and Sonoma Kella CMR, was helping me with my game that I was designing. Uh, I wanted the transition to localization, so... Uh, Tyler and I were hanging out. We were at some gathering, I'm sure. And, um, and I remember saying like, hey, I know we've been working on uh, Battles of the Gemini Guard for a while. What would you think about like segueing into games that are already designed that I would bring over from Japan and I, I would, you know, translate, localize these for the English market? Would you be interested in doing graphic design work in that capacity as well? It would it would be a different kind of graphic design work because you wouldn't necessarily be creating things from scratch, but you'd be modifying other people's layouts and other people's design work along with throwing in your, your own where, you know, applicable. He said, yeah, absolutely. So Tyler was my first recruit. Uh, and then I recruited my friend, uh, Ben, who has been kind of our QA lead. We, uh, the three of us were already working on my game together. Uh, ben was the main QA lead on that. I knew that I needed someone to come in and clean up and organize my rule book for my own game. That was Eli. So when I made the transition to Sinema Coliseum and to localization, I, I, the, the, the four of us had already been working together for a year. And so we knew each other very well. 
And so I reached out to all of them. You know, I first had that conversation with Tyler and then reached out to Ben and then, and then Eli to say, Hey, here's what's happening. Would you be on board with this? And all of them were like, absolutely. Let's, let's do it. So, uh, so, so the original team of Lionwing, which r- really would be like the original team on Sinema Coliseum R, there were um, us four, and then uh, and then Chris, who was our translator. And now Chris and I had worked together on various Sekai projects, uh, various games for Sekai Project. He was uh, he was my translator. I was his editor, and so we had worked on a lot of projects pretty closely. And so we knew each other's style very well. We gelled very well. We thought about localization in the same exact way. So uh, when we're, when working with Chris, it was like a, you know it was like a day off. I knew it was going to be easy, and so I reached out to Chris to say, "Hey, this is not video games localization related at all. Uh, this is a very different industry, but it's still Japanese games and it's still localization. Would you be interested in translating a Japanese board game?" And of course, he was like, absolutely, let's do it. And so I brought Chris on, and that was the original team. So I guess there were five of us. I ended up bringing on uh, Nicole later, who helped with uh, who helped with PR, and then uh, Rayma, who was helping with business relations, client relations, with, trans- um, with, uh, with translation on the client relations side of things. So like by the time that it was all said and done, there were, there were six or seven of us. That was the original team. So it started off as a combination of uh, people that I already knew in my real life, along with some professional colleagues that I knew uh, coming together to make that happen. So um, yeah, that's how it went down. Now, the next question sort of feeds into question two, and that is how did you choose the current team members for Lionwing projects and what kinds of qualities specifically to Lionwing do you look for as an employer? So I try to match interest and skill set to the project. I don't want someone um, who's not right for the project on a project because that that will show through an end result, and that's never that's never good for any kind of product, whether you're in this industry or in some industry not at all related to tabletop games or entertainment. So you really got to match skill set and, and interest and passion. Um, you know, some, some games take more asset creation while others require more like layout revisions. And when I think about like graphic design work, some people have both of those things. They can do both of those things. They can create assets from scratch. They can, they can create layouts on their own, whatever. Other people are better not creating on their own, but taking someone else's work and tweaking it so that it's all the better for your new audience. And so since graphic design work is so much a part of the experience in tabletop games, I really have to be probably the most uh, targeted in choosing a graphic designer for the project that I do for any other position the, uh, or person who's working on that game. And so you really got to make sure that you, you've got the right fit or else it's not going to work or you're going to have a cumbersome development cycle, which is either going to be frustrating, uh, you know, at best, or um, long and bogged down with delays at worst. I don't want to deal with any of those things. So at this point, especially at this point, I've really kind of learned, you know, who do I need to put where? Who do I want on projects? Um, and really playing toward each team member's strengths. Because I don't want to. I also don't want to be the person who puts someone on an, on an assignment that they don't want to do that they that they're just doing because I asked them to do it. I want someone to actually be interested in the job because you're going to do your best work when you're interested in something, as opposed to if you're just being um, not forced, but if it's something that you've been brought on to do and you don't really believe in it. Um, so I guess now what I look for in, in employees or new team members, and it's really a project by project kind of thing, if it's not someone that I've already worked with, at this point I'm looking for a couple key qualities. And I've really learned this, and I really learned it after Wild Hunt Festival. That's when, that's when it all really kind of started clicking about like who, who I wanted on a project who I needed on a project. And so, um, someone who's organized, I need someone who's highly organized, not just organized. I need someone who's highly organized. I need someone with initiative. I need someone with thoroughness, 
thoroughness and I need someone with an interest in, in the mission of Lion Wing. Those are the things that I look for. Once I find those things at this point, this wasn't always the case. This wasn't always my process. I look for those things first and then I look at skill set and try to figure out, all right, uh, is this person where I need them to be? And also, is this person the right fit for this coming project? So in the past, I would do it in the reverse order. I'd look for skill set first and then I'd look for like, you know, the more intrinsic stuff that's just in you or it's not in you, organization, initiative, thoroughness, et cetera, et cetera. But it's flipped now. I want that stuff before I even consider anything beyond that. Because if you don't have those things, then I don't really have a spot for you. We're doing so many projects and our projects just continue to get more complicated. Our projects just continue to get bigger. I no longer can be like involved in every aspect of a project, nor do I want to be involved in every aspect of a project any longer, just because the, the company is growing a lot faster and bigger than I was anticipating. So I now have to do like the more boring stuff and I need folks that I can trust and rely on to be able to do all those other things for me. So that's what I'm looking for in the chat. We got a question. So I know you have a lot uh, a lot of per project employees besides you, how many permanent employees do you have? Uh, exactly zero. Um, I have zero permanent employees. I am the only, uh, full-time permanent employee of Lionwing. Everyone else is on a contract basis. Now I tend to use the same people. Um, if not on every project, uh, then they'll kind of rotate in and out of projects. And at this point we've got so many projects and three different teams that, it kind of feels like I have permanent employees again, cause I kind of go back to the same people. Like I mentioned, once I find someone that I can trust that I can rely on, I typically don't want to like let them go. I don't want to have to find someone else. Those are hard qualities to find, believe it or not. So you've got to be multifaceted to work on projects that are in the tabletop industry. And that is especially true for our company and for the products that, that we take on. Uh, you've got to be cut from a different cloth. And so when I find someone who is cut from that different cloth, it's like, oh, hey, come on, come on, keep coming back, keep coming back. Um, permanent employees, though, uh, absolutely. No. No. Now, that's not to say that that, that won't happen. Uh, I think that that will happen. But as I've mentioned, 2020 was the first year uh, that line wing really got going. Yeah, we ran our first Kickstarter in, uh, in, in 2018 or whatever, but that was one Kickstarter and that was like, that was it, right? So 2020 was the first opportunity where we were like, all right, where I was like, all right, it's time to look at this less as a thing that I'm just doing on the side to supplement my day job and look at it more as an actual entity that I can and want to grow. But it's not like I had, it's not like I had or have startup capital or anything to be able to hire employees. And yeah, each of the Kickstarters have done beyond what we've asked for. But when you get down to actually like what it takes to pay someone a decent salary, pay them benefits, uh, we're not, we're not, <laughs> we're not making, we're not, we're not there. We're not there. So uh, we'll continue to work on a on a per contract basis. And I will continue to utilize the same folks, uh, for as long as possible. Question four, are there any near term future 2023 or sooner projects from Lion Wing that are being developed and designed 100% in house? Yes, there is one. There is one, as I've mentioned, localization is the thing that I'm really passionate about. And so, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, however you want to define that. I don't even think I can define it right now, but for the foreseeable future, uh, we will primarily be a localization studio and publishing studio. And then will come anything additional, such as stuff that we want to develop in-house. That being said, one project is being developed uh, in-house concurrently with what feels like a thousand other projects right now. It's not actually a thousand other projects, but my workload would dictate to me that it is a thousand projects. If you didn't tell me it wasn't a thousand projects, I would assume it was based on how many ways I'm split right now, but we're still, we're still making time to develop something in-house. 
<laughs> uh, comfy. How thick is that gunning up box behind you? Can I see the goodies? Yes, I am going to show off. Um, I'm going to show off that box here in the project update. So, uh, so sit tight. It's quite thick, quite thick indeed. What's your least favorite gun to play against and why is it Datara? It is Datara and it's because uh, I hate when someone locks me out of options. Coincidentally enough, that's why it's my favorite gun in the game because I like playing decks in any competitive competitive card game where I can lock folks down and lock them out of op options. I don't like I don't like aggro decks, those do nothing for me. Um, I don't like highly defensive decks, those do nothing for me. I don't like gimmicks, you know, strong gimmick decks, uh, those do nothing for me. I just like uh, control decks. They're my favorite. Um, there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of there's a, a lot of different viable approaches to playing a control deck in most of the games that I've played, and I like having those options to me. Whereas aggro decks, I I always feel like I only have one plan, and that is to move ahead in the most aggressive manner possible. I don't get that with control decks. There's a I can adapt, and I like. I like feeling like I have options and that no one is going to kind of put me in a corner and figure out my game plan and then be able to systematically dismantle me, you know, because my, my strategy is sort of one note. And that's also why I hate Tatara because it can lock down people, even if you're playing Tatara, because that's the type of control deck that it is. Boss man likes control. 100% explains his cues when it goes <laughs> audio video yes yeah i suppose i do i suppose i do i mean when i suppose when you're running a company you should like a little bit of control that's what i'll play it off as okay um question six when localizing something what would you say is the number one cause of error slipping through oh sure uh either having too many people actively involved in the asset editing and uh, and production process or not having enough folks there proofing your stuff either Either thing can sort of lead you to the same result, and that is uh, a, a product that has errors in it. So if someone were to say, like, you could have an infinite number of this type of position, of this type of person working with you, what would it be? And I wouldn't even hesitate to say proofreaders. If I could have 1,000 proofreaders, not editors, I don't, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want that. I just want one editor, preferably. But if I could have 1,000 proofreaders, I'd ask for 1,001 because you can never have enough eyes on your product. So this is why I have liked, this is why I've liked the gun and gun process so much. So, uh, so gun and gun, I was heavily, heavily involved in the, in the editing of that project. But because we put so much of Gun and Gun out there in front of people, whether it was through campaign updates, uh, Kickstarter campaign updates, or if it was through the Discord showing off assets, if it was uh, putting our stuff up on Tabletop Simulator, it got so many eyes on the product. And when you get that many eyes on the product, you get a lot of really good feedback. Now, yeah, sometimes you get shitty feedback, but you mostly get good feedback out of that. So Gun and Gun has been my favorite project to work on because it feels the tightest simply because so many people looked at it, which was awesome. And it's also going, it's also going to inform how we move forward with, with a lot of our projects. You know, we've had some really good editors we've had some really good proofreaders on on all of our projects in the past but when you work on something for so long and you retrace your steps over and over and over again on a project you know proofreading reading the same lines over and over and over you do it so much that you begin to either stop seeing errors or you see errors you don't register them or things that are missing, your brain just naturally begins to fill in the gaps because you know the product so well, you know exactly what it's supposed to say that, you know, if you're reading a sentence and there's a word missing, you've read, you've, you, you know the product, you don't even see the word missing any longer because your brain just naturally fills in that, that void. 
so you can know you can know and you can look at a product so much that you do a disservice to finding its flaws, which is why Gun and Gun has been such a good experience because we've had so many people looking at the product that it's like, oh, hey, what about that? Or, hey, what about that? And it's like, I've been looking at this damn game for nine months. Like, how did I miss that? And it's like, well, you missed it because you've been looking at it for nine months. That's exactly how you missed it. So I would say that too many cooks in the kitchen, I'll talk about that in the Testament update, versus not enough eyes on the product will lead you down the same path and to the same destination. All right, so I missed a couple uh, missed a couple things here in the chat. Let me catch up. Uh, Rogue said, yeah, I like being able to lock opponents out of options too. Being able to control the flow of the game feels good. It certainly does. Yeah, and, and, and a, in a card game, when so many things can feel out of your control, it's nice to feel like you've got a little slice of control in a very out-of-control environment. Uh, lock opponents out of the game. That was the whole Bulletstorm tournament, says F. We'll talk about that later. Um, it's good to get a lot of eyes because some of them are, yes, are fresher than, than yours. Yep. Um, have you ever gotten to a point where you question if normal regular words are misspelled? Even though, even though they aren't sort of hallucination of errors. Uh, I don't think I've gotten to that point where I'm like, is that how the word maintenance should be spelled? I've, ne I've never gotten there. Um, yeah, I've never gotten there. But I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll completely miss a misspelled word entirely like that. Yeah, that happens. Question seven, when bringing something to market via Kickstarter, how much work tends to happen before the Kickstarter itself launches? Uh, most of the work happens, at least with how we do things. Uh, I would say 60 to 65% of the work of a project is done before the Kickstarter launches. And then the remaining, um, what is that? 35 to 40% is what happens after the Kickstarter, it's your, it's your DTP, it's your asset creation based on anything that you created for the Kickstarter that you hadn't already created before the Kickstarter launched. Um, like putting a stretch goal sort of at the end because you're not, you were never really sure if you were going to get there anyway. You hit that point. It's like, oh, okay, awesome. Glad we did that, but we don't have that ready. So we've got to now create that. Uh, still though, over half of your work is done before the Kickstarter launches. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, three fourths of the work is done before the Kickstarter launches. Um, Made Night Saga is one of those games that will be more done than all of our previous projects just because of the type of game uh, that it is and just because our, our localization process was different on this project than it has been for previous ones and so it's a little bit more efficient. Uh, so we were, we were able to get more stuff done before it went to Kickstarter. Uh, Someone in the chat said, I very often have a similar issue when proofreading where I will say a word to myself over and over again to the point where it sounds like a word that <laughs> doesn't even exist. Um, <laughs> and then Rogue saying, yeah, same here. I start to ask, is this even a real word? I've, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't gotten that, but I, I have my own, I have my own issues, uh, you know, when it comes to seeing a product too much, seeing the same words too much. Okay, uh, question eight. How do you teach a game with a heavy meta focus like Gun and Gun to new players? Um, I, teach it as, I teach it as if that player uh, is never or does not give a shit about meta. <laughs> like, um, as if they don't even know what that word means, I think is typically my approach. Like, to me, if they want to learn the meta of a game they first have to be invested in the game and you don't get someone invested in a brand new game by talking about the optimal way to own jobbers at your local game shop. <laughs> like, um, I think if you start, if you introduce a game and you immediately start teaching the meta, you're a bad teacher. <laughs> um, I, I don't think you should do that because I don't think most people, there will always be exceptions to the rule. There will always be like friend circles who are different. I'm not making like a blanket statement here. I think most, underscore most people, when they're learning a game, don't care about how to optimally play it. 
They just care about learning it and to figure out like, is this game even for me? And they're probably going to stay in that state of mind for the first several playthroughs of that game as they feel out like, okay, first game under my belt. I kind of, I think I'm kind of getting it. Let me give it another shot to see if I fully understand it. Okay. Second time around. All right. I see how this game is working. Let me give it, let me give it a third time to see like, now that I know how it works, let me see how I can like play with it a little bit to see if it even really jives with like what I'm looking for third time around. Okay. Yeah, no, this is a game that I like. All right. Let me just, let me start playing it now. Now that I know how it works, let me start just playing it some more and having fun that eventually might get to them saying like, all right, so let's start doing some research on this. I want to get into this like more than the average person. All right. Now you've got some, you've got some cues that this person is ready to ready to maybe talk about made a level talk of that game, but that's not going to happen for a while. Of course there will always be someone first game, second game, third game. They're like ready to have that conversation. Maybe it's because the game really clicked with them. Maybe because they're a really competitive person, like overly competitive. Um, Maybe they knew about the game beforehand, had done a bunch of research on it, knew they were going to like the game. And so they were already invested before they even got to the table with that game. And so they want to kind of hit the ground running. I don't think those people are the norm though. At least in all the circles that I've ever played with friends, friends of friends, colleagues, coworkers. I've never seen that person. Again, it doesn't mean they don't exist, but I think your average player just wants to like learn the game and figure out if it's for them. And then down the road, they might really dig into it. I think about my own time with Summoner Wars. So I'd been playing competitive games long, long, long before Summoner Wars. I think Summoner Wars came out in 2011 or something, um, sometime around there. And so I had been playing Magic for a long ass time before that. And so clearly I was into the meta of Magic and there were some other things that I was into, but Summoner Wars is sort of like, to me, how I think most people experience games that they really get into and want to like know as much as possible. And that is like, I played the game the first time and I'm like, all right, that was cool. Like, I like, I like that. I was at a, I was at a game night. There were four of us. We played two separate games. Um, I think we each played like two or three games each. I went home that night. I was like, damn, that game is sick. Like, I really like that. Went to bed, got up the next day, texted my friend group like, hey, you guys want to get together again next week and play that? And everyone's like, yeah, that was cool as hell. Cool. I didn't think about the game again until like next week when it was game night. Like, okay, cool. We're going to play this game again. I, I've kind of forgotten it by now. A week's gone by. Let's go. We're going to play it again. We played like the same amount of games, two to three, maybe four games that night. We're all like, this game is fucking rad. Um, why don't we make this like a weekly thing where we just play this game for a while? And like, if we want to eventually play another game, cool. But like, let's just play this for a while. Let's just learn more about the game, learn the decks. We'll just keep doing that. We did that for like several weeks. I mean, several weeks undersells it. That probably happened for like two and a half months before I was like, dude, I got to know the optimal way to play this game. Like, this is just so sick. I need to like, I want to know like the ins and outs of this game. I think that's more of the common approach. So this is really taking the detour path to get to that destination of saying, I don't think you need to like talk about meta the first three times that you play a game with someone. I would hope that when you're teaching someone about something like gun and gun, you wouldn't even bother talking about the meta. Like, yuck yuck don't do that <laughs> let's like play it just like have fun and and like if someone has questions along the way or they're asking questions and like you can tell like oh yeah they're really into this like cool answer those questions or like talk about like hey you can do this you can do this or like here's why this deck is really cool or here's why i like this deck or here's what this deck has to offer etc cetera, etc cetera. but like even if they're asking the questions and you're having conversations about that you're probably not talking about meta you're just not so that would be my approach. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I, so I'm catching up with the chat here. Av said, um, so I'm abnormal if we follow Bradley logic. No, I don't think you're abnormal. Um, In all my time of, of being around people playing board games, I've just noticed that people tend to want to ease into like the heavy strategy talk. 
But if you're someone who's like, no, you play a game once or you research a game and you haven't even like played it yet, but you know, you're going to like it. And like, you want to like learn every element of it. Like, all right. So that just means that that game really speaks to you. But AF, if you're saying you're that person, I would imagine AF that you don't do that with every game you find. You only do that with games that really resonate with you. And you'll always have those games that resonate with you more than others where you want to know more. And some people are on an accelerated timeline where it sounds like AF, maybe you're like jumping right into it or you're on um, uh, a slower timeline. Like the Summoner Wars example, though the, I think that slower timeline probably is a more common timeline, but like, hey, whatever works for you. I just remember uh, the person who asked this question, who I think is in the chat right now. Um, I remember them saying like, I don't, something to the effect, I could be getting this wrong, but I think they were saying like, you know, I don't know how to like talk Meta with gun and gun with, with someone or something to that effect. And, you know, my response is like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Just play the game. Teach them the basics of the game. They will figure out if they want to learn the Meta on their own. Okay. In your research for future line wing projects, are you able to play test much of the game before you go into talks about contract and the Japanese uh, publisher and designer? Um, for uh, example, for Maiden Night Saga, how many games were you able to do before you went and told the team this is the one? Yes. So uh, I always play test a game before. I well, I mean, I have to play test a game because I, like, I have to like the game, right? Um, I have to like the game before I decide I want to invest uh, time and money into it. That probably goes without being said. Um, though I will say there are some games where I've done a lot of research, and this is, typ this is typically the case, where I've done a ton of research on the game before I ever get it in my hands. So normally I kind of have... I have an idea of what kind of game it is. I have an idea that of, of if I'm going to like it or not. But usually even, I have an idea of if, if I'm going to pursue this or not. So there are some instances where like, I mean, Made Night Saga is the perfect example where I hadn't played it yet. I had read up on it as much as possible. And I had already kind of made up my mind like, this is going to be a line wing game. I hadn't even played the game yet. I didn't even have a copy of it, but I had kind of made up my mind based on what I was reading. Like, yeah, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be the one. Um, but it's like, you, <laughs> you can't just like build a business off of gut instinct. Like, I think this is going to be the game that I like. Cause like what happens if you find the game that like, you're like, I think I'm going to like this one. Then you play it and like, this is garbage, but I already signed a contract for it. Cause I was overzealous and got ahead of myself. I don't want to do that. So even if I'm like, this is the one, I'm still going to play it. And I'm going to play it a lot. How many times did I play, how many times did I play Midnight Saga before I decided this is the one? I have no idea. Um, I don't know. Um, less than a dozen, more than half a dozen. That's probably about right. Especially with Midnight Saga was probably on the lower end uh, just because I did kind of have a really good understanding of what kind of game that it was. And I liked the vibe. I liked the art. I liked everything that I saw from the designers' interactions with people um, online. I don't know at all. Just like that was one of those like instinct is telling me this is the one. But hey, let's just let's just confirm it by playing it. And I think the only reason why I played Made Night Saga somewhere between a half a dozen and a dozen times was simply because I wanted to. You know, I look back on when I played it, I guess I probably knew after my first game, like, all right, that's the one. I probably knew that. But I think I liked the game so much that I just kept telling myself I need to play, I need to play more of it to make sure it's the game that I wanted. Yeah, because when I look back on it, it's like, yeah, I knew that was the game. 
I just wanted to play it more because I liked it so much, which is so funny because like, I'm not against Euros, do not get me wrong. Um, uh, there are plenty of Euros that I, I like, but it's not typically my go-to game. Like if you, if you lined up a whole series of games and a Euro was on the table and you, and you told me like, do the old, like pick your dodgeball team. Well, like Euros would be like that last kid that's picked in dodgeball. Like that for me, for me. Um, now that's not to say that I, just because I picked it last, I wouldn't like still play it and enjoy it. But it just isn't going to be the 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 genre that like immediately grabs me. So it was interesting that May Night Saga, which is not a Euro, but like more Euro than any other Lion Wing game so far. It's interesting why it why it was able to like captivate me so much. But I think it's one of those games that's just like it has all of the elements. It has all the things that you're looking for. It um it looks good, it plays good. It's accessible. It has a short rule book. As I've talked about, I hate long rule books. So it's got a short one. It just made sense. It does take place in England. Yes, although uh, England is not called England in the game. It's called Falticia. But London is still called London. <laughs> Tricky. Tricky. Uh, all right. Got some good chat, uh, uh, some good chatter happening in the in the chat about Meta Talk. Yeah, yeah, I, I like this. So one um, one of our community leads, Sin Theory, um, he said, "In the realm of games with friends, I am a supporter of letting your own Meta develop rather than talking about the Meta." Well said, well said, sir. Frank, you know, I didn't even I didn't even pick up on the joke that your statement about it does take place in England being a reference to it being a Euro. Whatever. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're like when you're on and like this camera's like pointing at you and expecting you to do something and there are other people on the other side of it and you're trying to manage show notes and your own thoughts, <laughs> trying to like keep track of time, you don't always see things in the way that you would had all of those factors not been there. So if I miss a joke from time to time, which is, this is not the first joke I've missed in the chat before, where I like respond to it seriously, don't hold it against me. Um, okay, let's see here. With Lion Wing, uh, with Lion Wing being, an an being anime focused with games, what kind of style of anime art really catches your eye off the bat? So I'll give you the kind by giving you a reference point. And my reference point is Testament's art. So Testament's art is probably my favorite anime style art because Testament's art can appeal to people who like anime and it can also appeal to people who do not like anime. So, I mean, that's, I think that's this, one of the special aspects of Testament is where some of our games, like you're probably not going to get into it if you don't like the anime aesthetic. I mean, look at Wild Hunt Festival, look at Sunday Coliseum, look at Gun and Gun. Like if you, if you don't like the anime presentation, those probably aren't going to be the games for you because they are so heavily anime Testament though. It's, it's that, it's that game that really like merges East and West sensibilities when it comes to visual presentation. And I think that, um, uh, allows it to have a, a nice identity that remains true to itself and remains true to its roots, but also, takes into account the larger global audience of people who are into anime and also not into anime. It's got kind of like that, that Final Fantasy vibe to it, that Final Fantasy XIV vibe. I mean, go figure, the whole game is kind of based around Final Fantasy XIV, but XIV has that same sort of appeal that you don't have to like Japanese RPGs to be into Final Fantasy XIV, and there are a ton of people who are not into JRPGs who love XIV, and I like that about Testament too when it comes to its its aesthetic. Um, it's it's very I think um, I think it's got a lot of, a, a lot of cross appeal to it. Yeah. All right. So I'm a uh, question eleven. So I'm imagining notorious good medicine and bad as bad medicine come from an old proverb that essentially translates to good medicine always tastes bad. 
Do you know if the big idea has any hidden meaning in original Japanese or not? And if so, what was it? So there is no real meaning behind why, um, why that skill is called the big idea, both in English and also what it's called in, in Japanese, which is a fairly close translation to the big idea. Um, and I, and I, I don't think that good medicine, bad medicine are actually based on, on that proverb that you're talking about there. Um, I think it is more based on the lore of, of who Notori's character is and what she does in the net, um, which, you know, not a lot of people will know because you don't have all of the lore for Testament, I mean for Testament, uh, for Gun and Gun. You'll have more lore once the game gets to you, but Keep Dry and also Lion Wing, we have lore about that game that people just don't know yet. Just because, you know, when you're designing a game, like you, most of the time, designers create a bunch of lore for the game and only put in some of it. Um, so, like, we know things about the game that haven't really been revealed yet narratively. And so I think that's a little bit more along the lines of why her skills are called what they're called. And that kind of goes for the entire, for the entire game. Also, I think it, it was sometimes when you're designing skills and then also in localization, sometimes you just go with like what sounds, you know, what, what sounds appealing to you, what sounds the coolest. Um, and it doesn't get any more, you know, it doesn't get deeper than that. I think when you're a fan of something and you really love it, you want to consume as much of that that thing as possible and you want to like really dig into every element of that product. Uh, there are, there are a number of franchises that I'm like that with. You can probably see some of them behind me where I'm like going through stuff and I'm like trying to draw connections. Like, Oh, I wonder if they meant this. I wonder if they meant that. And then I got to stop myself, especially doing what I do. And I'm like, they probably just like randomly chose that shit. Like they were just like this was just a day at the office for them. They were just like writing shit down <laughs> that sounded good. And I'm over here like, ooh, I wonder if this connects to that. And they're like, I don't know. I'm just trying to get through the day. And like I was told that I had to write this lore for Valkyria Chronicles, and <laughs> this is what I thought sounded good on this Tuesday afternoon. And I'm over here trying to connect stuff. So I I don't know. Uh, I think sometimes that happens, but when it comes to Notori specifically, that stuff, uh, her skills, even the art, uh, have lore implications, lore meanings. Keeping on the naming scheme, um, it seems most of the weapons themselves are named after specific legends or figures. Will we ever get an English speaker's guide to gun and gun? guns type of thing over each name's significance. So probably not, probably not something narrowly focused on the guns. Um, but I don't think that it is out of the realm of possibility. And in fact, I can sort of imagine this where if there's a future Kickstarter or a future release, we offered a sort of world guide setting book. I think that's very realistic. I think that is something I'm very interested in. Um, as someone who loves to dig into um, the lore and the background of, of certain things that really mean something to me, uh, I like when companies put out that kind of secondary media, like, it's not really attached to the core product in terms of you engage with the core product in a certain way, but you engage with the secondary product in a different way. Like I like that kind of stuff. I like it a lot. Um, and I think you'll see that also with made night saga, as we've talked about, you know, there's a whole web novel, which like, you don't need to read the web novel to have fun with the game. It's, but if you're like me and you and you find stuff that you really dig and you want to like dig into it as much as possible, I'd like to be able to provide that for folks with Gun and Gun. So I mean, a lot of, uh, I think this came from Fern in the chat if I'm remembering correctly, and uh, Fern is one of our most avid players of the game. I think he sees Gun and Gun in sort of the same way that I see Gun and Gun. Uh, Gun and Gun's got this really fascinating world, and I'm 
endlessly fascinated by it. I have no idea if keep dry sees it the same way or if they're kind of like in that former boat. I also think about like, um, I think about like Harrison Ford in Star Wars. He was doing some interview after The Force Awakens came out and uh, whoever was interviewing him was like, uh, what was the best part about, you know, returning to play Han Solo? <laughs> And his answer was like getting paid, right? Like it was just another day at the office for him. He was just doing a job. I don't know if keep dry sees gun and gun as like just a thing that they have created that we all love so much, or if they're into it as much as the rest of us are. I tend to think that they're into it as much as, much as the rest of us are just based on their dedication to the product from our interactions with them, what they've been able to tell me about various things about Gun and Gun, but also just looking at their other product core connection. Um, so I, I think it would, I think it's reasonable to think that at some point we would see extra media for Gun and Gun um, because I think there's a, I think there's a market for it. And as I've mentioned, Lionwing is basically just a company where I just like localized games that I want to play. Well, I want to learn more about Gun and Guns world. And if, <laughs> and if I want it, then you can uh, bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to try to figure out some way to make it happen in terms of turning it into a product that we can all enjoy. Ben, uh, let's just see here. I just had something come up at work and I assume I missed every single question asked. No, you've only missed half of them. <laughs> I'm only on question 13. Though kind of the more involved questions that have already been asked, but still, you haven't missed them all. What programs do you use? Question 13. What programs do you use for designing card layouts, et cetera? Uh, Photoshop and, and um, Illustrator uh, primarily. Usually it's just Illustrator. Okay, you said you play Kill Team. So what are the factions you play? Tau, baby. Tau, all day long. I don't need to play any other faction. Tau. They're the most Japanese <laughs> uh, race in, in Warhammer. So, of course, I'm playing Tau. They're like super anime, right? So uh, when I was getting into 40K, however many years ago that was, um, it was it was one of those properties where like I'm like, this is not typically something that I would like. Like, this is very... This is very much so like a thing that I normally would not get into. Um but, you know, I was reading up on the lore. And I'm like, this is when you dig into it, like this lore is really cool. And like, <laughs> I don't think I could ever get to the bottom of all this because there's been so much lore written for it. But I found out about the Tau and I was like, OK, this just went from something that I was like, eh, like this seems cool. But I don't think I could ever get into it. That's not striking me to. All right. So I guess I'm playing 40K now, huh? And that's how that went. Are Tau still as controversial as when they came out? Uh, no, they are not. So uh, when they first came out, it was pretty... Um, th there was essentially one build that everyone played. And it got to the point, at least at my local shop, if you went in and you, and you played Tau, doesn't, it didn't matter like what your, what your uh, faction consisted of. People would, I mean, you could just see it come over them like, oh, hey, we're going to play. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm playing Tau today. I mean, you could just see it like either it was the win, like taken out of their sails, like, oh, fuck. Or it was, are you are you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me? Play something else. Um, so it wasn't all that enjoyable, at least with my local, my local crowd to play Tau in the beginning of Kill Team. Man, I would say Tau was the most hated army in early kill team uh, this iteration of kill team um than any other army i'm trying to think if there was another army that was like frowned upon as much as them i don't think there was um i was thinking more in terms of lore uh, plus look compared to the rest of the series, which is super grim dark. I didn't, I didn't get that. I, I didn't get that vibe at all. Um, yeah, I didn't get that vibe. I, I got more of the vibe of you're showing up with a bunch of suits and I know how this is going to go. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Uh, but I haven't played Kill Team. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, certainly since the pandemic. But I think I was on like a eight-month hiatus, six-month hiatus. Be- yeah, something like that. Um, even before the pandemic of where I played Kill Team. So it's been a while. I still keep up with Kill Team. I still watch battle reports every <laughs> every week. Um, in fact, battle ports like really supplemented a lot of my time in lockdown. Um, I don't know. Kill Team seems like the forgotten. I think I mentioned this in Discord. But Kill Team seems like the forgotten product line by Games Workshop, and I know they've come out and said like, "Oh no, like we're still we're still doing stuff with it. We're still we still support it. It's not dead." Like. Oh, actions speak louder than words, especially when it comes to GW. So I don't know. I I, I said before that I, ne- I never thought I'd see the day when <clears throat> Lord of the Rings or Middle Earth SBG gets more releases than a 40K product line. But like, here we are. Okay, what's your opinion on Bulletstorm? Was there something you wish was different? I think Bulletstorm went exactly as intended or at least it went exactly as I expected. We saw a lot of the same builds. Um, we saw a lot of the build, a lot of builds that I think we were expecting to see for a first tournament. Um, we saw a lot of Kasane, obviously we saw mostly Notori. We saw some Kiriko. I saw Habana show up once, no twice. I don't know if I saw a single ran, Saw a lot of Kasana Inra. I don't know. It's it's kind of what I expected. It probably didn't help that Kasane was the last gun that we introduced in Tabletop Simulator. So, like, it still felt pretty new. It still feels pretty new. So I think people are smitten with it. I think people are having a hard time figuring out how to run counter to Kasane. I think people still assume that Kasane is an auto win. So it makes sense why we saw that gun so much. It makes sense why it performed so well. I think in the early goings of a new game, aggro meta is the meta. Uh, because because people don't they haven't figured out exactly all the ins and outs and how to play the game in other ways other than rush. And it doesn't help that Gun and Gun is naturally just a rush-oriented game. So you take a rush-oriented game, you introduce as the last gun to people a rush-oriented gun, and it makes sense why you're going to have people creating loadouts around a rush-oriented approach, strategy. So we saw a lot of that. Uh, Was there something you wish was different? I don't know if I wish anything was different. I think... I think Bulletstorm went off exactly, yeah, as intended and as expected. Now, there would be some things that I would do different on, like, the production end of things, but I knew that was going to happen as well. Uh, A, never running a tournament before, but more importantly, B, never streaming of what turned out to be a a five-and-a-half-hour tournament before. I knew going in, like, all right, we're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And we're going to apply those lessons to upcoming tournaments and to the virtual league. And so in many ways, Operation Bulletstorm was something cool to do as we wait for the physical products, but it was also a way to figure out like, all right, so what, what should we continue to do? And then what will we need to do different in the future so that we run even better events? Like you've always got to have a first, right? And so Bulletstorm was our first and so if there was anything that I wish was different, it was that. Now, Sin had, Sin had thrown out some ideas about what some future events could look like, what we might introduce, kind of utilizing some stuff from, I think he was talking about Hearthstone. Now, I haven't played Hearthstone in so many years that I really couldn't tell you anything about Hearthstone when it comes to their competitive scene. But I think that's something that we, we will continue to think about how to ensure that gun and gun events are as fun as they possibly can be. So as a first run through, Sin says in the chat, I can't think of anything that went wrong or not as intended. Yes. Yep. I think it went exactly um, how I wanted it to. 
like I said, some production things that I'm going to change and uh, misspelling a, a participant's name from Fry Guy Fern to Fry Gun Fern, which is arguably a better name. I'll make sure not to do that again. Ben said, I missed my opportunity to make a joke about how I wasn't salty at all when I asked my question mentioning Datara. Yes. If I remember the context and what led up to you asking that question, I remember you were on, on that salty dog. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Question... Uh, 16, what are your thoughts on a once a month gun and gun game night for months without tournaments? A more casual environment would probably be better jumping, probably be a better jumping off point for new players. And you might even see your sweet, sweet Hockerman. So if you joined us live or you watched the playback of Operation Bulletstorm, you saw that I was really rooting for uh, an appearance from Hockerman. And we had one player who, who was brave enough to field Hockerman during the tournament, um, they lost that match pretty, pretty handedly. <laughs> handedly. <laughs> but we saw Hockman, and if you go back and watch that point on the stream, the stream just like came to life with people so stoked to see Hockman. I mean, it. I think it was Desolator who played Hockman and in their loadout, and like, I don't even care, Des, that you lost. I was just so happy that you played it. And I think everyone else was because like we all just went crazy to see Hockman on the field. Um, so yes, I love the idea of a monthly gun and gun night. Love it, love it, love it. And that's that even is underselling how much I like that idea. So uh, someone in the chat brought this up. I don't remember whose it was. It may have been Sens. It may have been someone else. Whoever it was, I'm sorry that I can't remember. Um, but I love the idea and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to use that idea. That's, that's going to be a thing that happens. So now I just have to put together how I want that to happen and how we're going to get the news out to people. So stay tuned. That's going to be a thing that happens. Question 17. We're almost done with the community questions. Will you be offering signed cards as a reward in the future? Yes. Yes, indeed. I like that kind of thing. It's what I like, and I think people like it as well. Question 18. How challenging was it to run bullet storm well i think sin probably had the worst of it honestly <laughs> uh, in terms of like the lead up he he did all the heavy lifting when it came to setting up the, the format setting up the players making sure people were matched um making sure that the ship ran smoothly with people having their questions answered in a timely manner both about the tournament and about things that came up while playing in their matches i mean really sin was the hero of operation bulletstorm in terms of like tournament day running it was pretty easy other than there was a section of the day that like we kind of lost 40 minutes because it was a match that went really long and and like that's cool like players need whatever time they need to to play their matches that's not that's not my problem at all but my problem was we didn't really have anything else lined up for if that kind of thing happened so we'll be thinking about like those more logistics uh issues for the upcoming events especially the ones that are streamed to ensure that it just runs smoothly now fortunately at that point there were plenty of people in the chat talking and then beans and sin were with me so there were three of us just kind of like spitballing and talking randomly about gun and gun and about other things so like we filled the time but i'd like to avoid that again if possible so i think um you know that was one of the obstacles we ran into and something that i will look to change in the future Uh, sorry, I'm just catching up on some some chat here. Uh, mad applause for Sin, the uh, attorney coordinator. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Sin says, hell, I even got out of bed to answer questions. I mean, like I said, Sin was the unsung hero of the entire, the entire event. So uh, without him and without Beans as well, and I don't want to undersell Beans' role in, in all of this because he had a big role too, um, but certainly without, uh, without Sin, that event would not have gone the way that it went. So much love to Sin. Everyone give him a shout out. 
is the turn one Hockman auto cannon strategy actually viable? Were you surprised by tournament gunner choices? Nah. I mean, I expected to maybe see, I expected to see at least one ran. At, now, Sen and I, we didn't catch every match, uh, especially in round one, because we were mostly just focused on our first match. Then we jumped, I think, to at least one other um, round one match. But So I didn't see them all. So it's possible that someone ran with ran. Uh, um, so it's possible. I didn't see it. Frank says I played one ran off stream. So I'm guessing that wasn't for turn for the bracketed tournament day, right? Frank for the bracketed tournament day. I did not see anyone, but maybe that's what you mean, Frank. Maybe you ran. It was okay, cool. So we at least had uh ran fielded once. I think we had Habana fielded only a couple times. I expected to, I expected to see a bit more Kirikos. I was actually sort of surprised by that, but I think people are really smitten with uh, what you can do with Notori, what you can do with good medicine, what you can do with the big idea and how you can combine those with certain guns. I think people like Notori's hand size. I, I mean, there are legitimate reasons why we saw so much Notori, but I guess I just expected uh, there to be more gunner diversity and people trying some things out. And at the same time, I'm not surprised because I think by the time we got to Sunday, people treated Sunday's tournament a lot more seriously than they did the lead up round robin portion of the event. So I think people like showed up Sunday and while there might have been some experimentation happening, I think a lot of people showed up to like play the best build. And like, that's always going to happen in a tournament. It doesn't matter how casual it is. It doesn't matter how you bill it, whether you bill it as like a fun thing or a serious thing. When it comes to tournaments, if there's something on the line, even if it's just bragging rights, people are going to try to win. And to win a lot of the times in, in the card game scene means playing the best bill. Now, it doesn't always mean that. And you'll always have players who want to specifically not play uh, the optimal build. I think about Af, who very much so does not like to play meta builds. So you'll always have, you'll always have kind of both of those ends of the spectrum. But I did expect people to show up and play kind of the the builds that not only they felt comfortable with, but the builds they felt would win them games. I mean, shit, that's that's probably what I would do. So, not surprised there. I also expected to see more new A's, but I understand why I didn't see a lot. Though I certainly saw more new A's than I saw Rants and Habanos, so, and more than Hakamen. Frank said, I mostly played Habana every game. Yeah, Frank, I think I only saw one of your, two of your games. I can't remember. It's all kind of blending together. When, when, when you're commentating over five and a half hours of one game, you start losing track of the, of the minute details uh okay for let's see here last question for each of the line wing games what is your favorite thing to play i think i've mentioned this in um in another in another video um but i mean i so i like uh i like as I mentioned, Datar a lot. I really, really like Dodome from Overheat. I like Habana. I like Kage Hisome. I don't know. My uh, yeah, I, I I think I've talked about like a couple loadouts that I like, but yeah, those are, those are the, the the components that I like to play with a lot. I don't really like Notori. Uh, I very rarely play with Notori. I mean, I did initially, like when I was not, I mean, not even when I was learning the game. I think I played Rand and Habana to learn the game. But then like once I got comfortable with the game, I think I favored Notori for a while. And then I like went through a phase where I liked Kiriko. And then um, once I really feel, felt like I understood the game um, and incorporated Overheat into it, I went back to Habana uh, quite a bit. Um, I like Amata. Amata's fantastic a lot of people like maka i don't know i'm i'm just kind of like droning on about what i like at this point in terms of embryo machine as i mentioned four knees i love four knees i love four knees 
I love four knees. I was hoping four knees would win the the poll uh, for the for at least one of the next embryo machine units to be added to the tabletop simulator version of the game. Four knees did not win the poll. Um, I've talked about some of my Wild Hunt Festival builds and Testament builds before in the past. I like running very standard builds in Testament, very standard uh, parties with each character playing their intended role. There is really no intended role in Testament, but we kind of set it up as if, at least when it comes to the lore, that they have intended roles, so I like to play it that way. When it comes to Wild Hunt Festival, I like to play really weird um, party compositions, if nothing else, and to challenge myself. I love bringing special characters into my party. I love Elizabeth as a troubadour. She is fantastic. Um, yeah, so Wild Hunt Festival is probably where I get the most creative with, uh, with my setups um, and that kind of thing. Sorry, I, I have answered this question before, so I'm not going into like specific details. If you really want me to get into specific details, I certainly will. But I think I answered that. Uh, I think that was five episodes ago. I think that was episode 12, episode 11 or 12. <laughs> Frank in the chat said, just add four niece anyway. All right, so uh, <laughs> Bradley is the president. That's right. I can do what I want. Um, that's it for uh, community questions. Let's talk about project updates because we're, we're running long. How long have we been on now? I've been recording for an hour and 11 minutes. Okay. So project updates, Testament. Testament is getting into backers' hands. It's in most people's hands at this point, I believe. I think um, One Stop Co-op Shop is streaming some Testament gameplay tonight. So it's both uh, very exciting and disheartening that testament is in people's hands. Exciting because like, of course it's exciting to get your game in, in front of people. Disheartening because the game has shipped with more errors than uh, we were expecting, we were liking. And it's errors from kind of like all around, which are the worst kinds of errors. It's got some, it's got some text errors. It's got some production errors. Most people can deal with one but when you put the two together, it gets a little frustrating. So I mentioned this in the Discord yesterday when I was talking with the folks in the Testament channel. Testament had a lot of people involved in it. Four parties. Typically, there are only two, like two heavily involved. There were four for Testament. And when you get that many people involved in the process, it's easy to, to lose track of things. It's easy for every person <laughs> in, in the process to lose track of what all the other people are doing. It just is. So I think what we're seeing with Testament, and it's, you know, it's text errors or whatever, and it's production errors, I think we're seeing the result of... Uh, too many cooks in the kitchen. So it's unfortunate. I mean, it's unfortunate for all the obvious reasons. It's especially unfortunate. I'm going to be selfish for a minute. It's especially unfortunate for us because we worked on Testament longer than we worked on any other game. A lot longer than we worked on any other game. None of our games have had the length of a development cycle as we had on Testament. There were a lot, a lot, a lot of like working until 3 a.m. on Testament. And if you're following the timeline, we were working on Testament long before 2020. We were working on Testament throughout 2019. And as I've mentioned, like up until the middle of 2020, like Lion Wing was just something I was doing on the side. After all, up until Testament launch, we only had one board game under our name. So like it was very much a part-time thing. And so to, you know, I would come home from my day job. I get home around five or whatever. I'd eat dinner with my family and I'd see my kid. I'd see my wife. And then at like seven 30, after I gave my kid a bath, I'd come downstairs and I'd work on Testament until like 3am in the morning. And then I'd get up at six and I'd get my kid ready 
for daycare. I take them there. I go to work and I do it all over again for months and months and months. I mean, that that's, so we put a lot of time in the Testament. We, we neglected a lot of stuff in our life to even make Testament happen. I remember I was talking with Manifest Destiny early on. Uh, it was um, late 2018. Yeah, late 2018. Because I think we first announced the game that we were working on the game in January of 2019. Um, but in late 2018, I was talking with Manifest Destiny and and the Manifest Destiny rep was like, know what you're getting into. And I remember like the tone And I remember thinking, like, I got it. I know. I know. I played the game. I got the game. I know what I'm getting into. I didn't know what I was getting into. (laughs) Um, So, Testament means, it meant and it means a lot to me just because of the amount of time I spent with it, which is more time than any other game. So, for it to ship in a state that can't be um, anywhere close to perfect is just, like, Crushing, but it's also crushing. The thing that hit me most, you know, I, I, I watch Discord all day. I'm not always engaging in the Discord chat, but I'm watching it. So I see most of what goes on in there, at least in like the main like line wing channels. Uh, I, I miss things in like the, you know, like the video games channel or anime channel or whatever, but I'm really always laser focused on what's happening as it relates to our games. And I remember you know, I saw a lot, a lot, a lot of what was being said in, in the Testament channel, which by the way, everyone's been super cool about it. Thank you all. Like, fuck, you guys are cool as hell. Um, it chokes me up because you guys are so nice. Um, so I saw someone yesterday, I think it was yesterday, and I don't remember their exact wording, but they were like, I don't back stuff on Kickstarter often, but I back Testament. And, and, and then they were like, it's disheartening to like, you know, see all this, but like, I really appreciate your transparency about this, Bradley. So again, super cool, but also expressing like, yo, I don't take the risk on Kickstarter games often. And I did on a game that you're a part of And we're left with, you know, some, some errors in the game, which is not ideal. And it was like, fuck, out of all the things that I read, it's like that one hit me like the hardest, like, like if you can get close to heartbreaking in this line of work, like that was it, you know, that was it. Um, so that really bummed me out. So I've been, I've been not like, yeah. I've been not like super pleased about this. There's nothing I can do about what's already happened, right? Like what made it into the game or didn't make it into the game, regardless of where the blame lies and the blame lies on all of us. (laughs) Like we can't do anything about it now. The game has shipped and people have it. So for me, it's it's now my mission of like, fuck, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to solve this. Um, So now it's about putting my nose to the grindstone and thinking about solutions, obvious ones and creative ones. How we, how we, how we make this right for people. Now this is a unique situation because, you know, I'm not the only, I'm not the only person involved in this. Ultimately Japanime. um, So it's a co-publishing deal, but you know, everything runs through, is running through them, obviously. I mean, you can see that just from the um, from the Kickstarter it ran under theirs, under their banner. So, like, they have the ultimate say. But in my experience, Japan Mail always has and does the right thing. So I have confidence that we're going to figure this out. But I have ideas in my head of like, all right, here's you know, here's what I want to do, and I've expressed those to Japan Mail, and we're working this thing out. So. That's where we're at with Testament. The people who have asked questions and gotten answers and have been able to play the game regardless of, you know, certain cards or whatever and still enjoying it, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I think 
there's probably there's probably 10 cards in the game that we will reissue in some in some form. I don't know the format of how ultimately those will be reissued, but there's probably about 10 that'll be reissued. And then the others can just, I think they'll be handled fine with just like an FAQ. Um, you'll always, I think with a game the size of Testament, there are bigger games, don't get me wrong, but it's not a small game Testament. With games the size of Testament, you'll always have an FAQ. You should, you're probably doing things wrong if, if you don't have an FAQ. So we'll, we'll address those things through the FAQ, which is on Board Game Geek um, right now. It's a little barren right now because I'll talk about that in, in a second. But the other things will be sort of, my hope is that we're able to offer an errata pack and, uh, and to handle things that way. I know in the past, I think Japanime, when they've encountered this kind of things, they've also offered like paste ups and that kind of thing. The point is we're working on it. We're going to figure it out. So, um, All right. So that's Testament. Yeah, Mox. So Ma Mox is saying Japan is really great about shipping out errata packs. Yeah, I mean, honestly, most publishers are, especially publishers the size of Japan. Like I said, in my experience, Japan has always had customers' interests at heart in terms of taking care of them with things like this. So I think we'll be good. I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. But now it's just like, you know, we're doing the work to ensure that we're able to get that stuff to folks because that's important. Uh, we're not we're not going to fuck it up a second time, you know. So the the FAQ I talked about before being a little barren on BGG that's intentional. I even posted a little update to that post last night to say, hey, here's what's going on, and what's going on is uh, we've got fifteen questions, fifteen to seventeen questions. Um, that people have asked in the discord for further clarification. Now, some of those things are like, just to point out, like, is this supposed to be it? And it's like, well, no, that's part of, that's part of the things that we need to take care of you know, a misprint or whatever. But then some of our, like their questions about clarification. So what I'm doing is I've taken all of the questions that I found in the discord. I've put in, put them into a word doc. I've given them to our, our editor, our QA lead, but then I've also reached out to manifest destiny and Kuro um, because there are some things that we want to make sure that we're providing the exact response for. Like I said, I don't, with the FAQ, I don't want to, I don't want to create more questions from the FAQ. That's not the point of an FAQ. So I'm making sure that I have all of the information before I send it out to everyone, before I send it out to the universe to do whatever with, um, which is why I'm not just like issuing the FAQ answers right away. Um, I'm, I'm making sure uh, we have things exactly as they need to be had so that there's no room for misinterpretation as it pertains to the questions that people have asked about some, you know, vagueness of certain cards or skills or whatever. So that's Testament. Wild Hunt Festival is the game that I don't really have any updates for tonight. I mean, our big update was last week. Um, so... The game was in customs last week here in the U.S. The game was en route to its fulfillment destination in Europe. And then the game had already been inventoried in Australia. So uh, I had said that we're looking at fulfillment early June. Yeah, uh, you know, that's going to happen. So, you know, that, that, that's the best news I have on Wild Hunt Festival is it's going to happen uh, exactly as intended with our revised schedule of June. So look out for that. As soon as I have more information, I will definitely give it to you. I can't wait to be able to give you Wild Hunt Festival information. I'm dying. I'm dying, people. I love Wild Hunt Festival. Okay, Gun and Gun. So we had Operation Bulletstorm on Sunday. It was awesome. If you missed the five and a half hour event, you can catch it on YouTube. It's all there in its glory. I think the HD version has finally been processed. At least I hope it is. I know it was at 1080p yesterday. I'm hoping that it's finally been um, processed in its 1440 iteration. But what's most important about Gun and Gun is I got the second round of proofs today. So I'd been waiting on these. I said that they were going to go out the early part of this week. They did. They were supposed to get here at the end of the week. They showed up early. Boom. So let's talk about 
let's talk about these second rounds of proofs. I said in the Discord earlier, after I went through everything, like this is the second set of production proofs. Like this is exactly what you want to have happen. So the production, this, the second round of production proofs is exactly um, what we wanted. The changes that we wanted to be made have been made. The additions that we wanted to be added to the game have been added and everything looks the way it's supposed to look. All right, so let's talk about a few things. First, the storage box. Oh, one second. All right. So, all right, so here was the old storage box. Um, you know, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's glossy though, hated that. It's massive, hated that, not like, massive in length that that didn't bother me it's like it's just it's huge like what storage box has that that much space between the cards and the side of the box i don't it just looked dumb right and it just i didn't like the 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 gloss finish i thought it looked cheap i thought it showed the the ridges and because the gloss finish i thought it showed the ridges in the in the cardboard um and it also just felt like it was missing a few things so I went back to them and I said, all right, not only do we got to change the size of this thing, because this is fucking comically massive, um, it just looks like shit. So we got to do something different. Here's what I want to have happen. I want to shrink that box up a little bit so that it's not, um, you know, the Titanic. Um, the Titanic. <laughs> the Titanic. Um, and I also want to get rid of that awful gloss because it just looks horrible. I want a matte finish. Um, and I want to add some things to it. So... Now, disregard this because my, my child decided to step on this earlier. This is what happens when you have toddlers running around and you're trying to do work at home is they step on it. Um, anyway, disregard that. Here's our new box. This thing is posh. It's matte. It feels good. It looks good. We added a couple things. Flip it around. Logos to the bottom. Those were not there. You can also see it's normal size now, oh my God. Add a little something there on the sides, which was not there on the sides. Oh, box 001. What does it mean? A little verbiage there and normal size inside. So, yeah, so my, my four-year-old stepped on it and the box held up. And you know, four-year-olds, they don't pull their weight. They're just like stepping on shit. <laughs> like, like, I mean, like they don't care. And it, it withstood that. So, um, so this box is uh, amazing. Can we see the card fit into the new box? Yes. I wish I had some, I wish I had a card sleeved down here, but I, I was using my card sleeves upstairs for this very reason, but I'll show you it without a sleeve. Oh, let me just grab this. Uh, save that for later. Sorry, indecisive here. So they sent me a uh, second round of foils again. I'll show these off in a second. So, not too snug, just enough room. Gets a little tighter when you put the, uh, when you put sleeves in there, but still plenty of room to work with. Also, I wanted a little bit of room, a little, little bit of extra room um, between the cards and the side of the box so that if people wanted to store their gun cards, uh, horizontally along the back side, they'd have the ability to do that sleeved. Uh, so there's room there as well. All right. So there is the box. Imagine after three expansions for all the cards. Well, I mean, what do you think the 001 is for? All right, foils again, um, the foils are no different than they were uh, the last time. 
um, other than the last time we had a, they were foiled on the back. I don't, I don't know why they sent me production proofs as if I wanted both sides of my cards to be foiled. <laughs> so I was like, Hey, thanks for doing that. Like, I'm, I'm glad I could see what it looked like. I, I would not have like asked for that myself, but like, nah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, so foils, All right, so this is the real centerpiece. Um, okay. So the box front looks like the other box front. But this thing is huge now. So here's the old box. Uh, size quite a bit bigger. So I think I mentioned at least in Discord, but also maybe in the campaign update that they sent me the game in this box and I'm like, oh, well, that's actually like, hey, I like the size of that, like pretty thin. But I open up the box, uh, like the box that all the production proofs came in and you know, I pull this thing out and it's, it's literally like this, right? So like half sticking up like this. And I'm like, uh, oh, like maybe just like the box got dislodged because it wasn't in any like shrink wrapping, sh shrink wrapping. And I'm, I'm like, oh, it probably just got dislodged or something. I open it up and it's like, no, the box actually wouldn't fit all of the components. And I guess they thought I'd be okay with that. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not okay with that. Make the box bigger. So they made the box bigger. Now we took the opportunity to throw our logo on the side. Um, you can see where my son got to this one as well. And yeah, threw the, threw the logo on the, on the sides. Let's open this baby up real quick. All right, so here's how it comes packaged. These are the pack and play mats. So we had an option. We could have gone with some really, really, really shitty paper play mats that like got creased and tore apart after you folded them up like three times. We decided instead to go with super durable play mats. Um, So here's the thickness of the play mats. I mean, as you can see, here's a play mat. Honestly, it's, it's the play mats that made the box so thick. It was primarily the play mats that were causing the previous box not to be able to uh, close, so. Lion tested Bradley approved. That is the truth, Rogue. That is the truth. These boxes can withstand my child. They can take on anything. All right, so. From there, we got our three books. Two manuals. Manga. Just grab a random fold boom there's our manga so sweet and then inside we've got an upside down deck gun cards burn tokens Our player aids, which I'm not even sure people have seen the player aids yet. I can't remember if I showed them off, but they turned out extremely well. Um, wind conditions, uh, phases, 
order of events because people are always like, hey, in what order do these things resolve? And then every card in the game, right there. That way you've got a quick reference with, uh, you know, what comes in what deck. So that's the Corset Guns and Overheat. So those are our player aids. Life counters. So, I don't know if I've shown these off either, but here's how these babies turned out. So we got up to 40, because if you know anything about overheat, you know that Maka has a life total that's more than all the other gunners. And, and since you can't overheal, and got a gun, 40's all you need. Anyway, we decided to uh, put this little bullet right here as the indicator, because like, <laughs> why not? Once you get down to five life, you're in the red. Little stylistic choices that uh, Wynn and I decided to add. Anyway, these, uh, yeah, these are really nice. Uh, I was, if you saw in the Kickstarter, the you know, the concept image, which was just a concept image, as I mentioned on the Kickstarter. Um, I originally was thinking it was going to be like a dual dial, like you'd get in Aeon Zen or um, Marvel Champions. But then one night I was playing um, Brawl. I was playing uh, Magic, the Brawl variant, and I pulled out my Brawl decks that I had purchased. And they came with life counters that we're very similar to this, and I was like, wait a second. No, 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 no. We're not doing a shared dual wheel counter. We're doing individual life counters. So, here we go. All right. Uh, burst icon would have been sick, but loving the life counter too. Cool. So, those are, oh. All right, so I'm not sure what happened to this card because in the first round of production samples, now nothing changed with the jumbo card, but in the first round of production samples, the card wasn't rounded. So I'm wondering if, if it was packed weirdly. I'm wondering if moisture got to it. I don't know what happened, but we do not anticipate that the jumbo card will, be, will have this curvature to it. That's disappointing. That being said, the, the jumbo card itself um, is pretty sweet. So there's a jumbo card. I do not have the plastic sleeves yet, the protective sleeves, because those are being produced separately. Those will go out. Those will go out June 1st. So those, those are being uh, produced separately, which means they did not come with this batch of production samples. The printer was like, hey, we're just going to send them all out at once. And I was like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just <laughs> send me send me them in separate orders. I will pay extra. I don't care. Uh, I want to see the, the core components um, because the sleeves are being mass produced differently and at a different part of the printer than, than our core components. So what is going to happen? So everything looks the way it it needs to look. So I'm going to give uh, I'm going to give the printer to the go ahead this week to move into mass production. Mass production will likely start the end of next week would be my guess. It could start a little bit before that, but probably the end of next week. So though mass production will start on all of the the, the core contents, the Kickstarter exits, et cetera, et cetera, next week. The sleeve mass production, though, will start probably the week or two weeks after that. Now, the difference being mass production on the sleeves takes like three days. Mass production on the game takes like three weeks. Um, so they're going to be produced separately. Um, and in fact, mass production uh, probably won't take three weeks for this one. It'll probably take two weeks for Gun and Gun because we're not asking them to do anything crazy. So I don't have the sleeves yet, but 
all of this will go into mass production. We'll get the go ahead this week and then we'll go into the actual mass production process next week. All right, let's check. Um, let's see here. Okay, would have been cool if 15 and below were a different color to indicate the ability to use burst effects. <laughs> So I was just about to say something, and then I literally read Comfy Monkey say, don't give him ideas. We will never get our cards. So right before I, I read that Comfy, I was going to say, well, there's still time I can change it if people feel that strongly about it. Uh, <laughs> that, that can happen. Um, I mean, really, that's like, um, that's like, a, that's an easy fix. That's. That that would be an easy fix. That would be like a um, like a, a five minute fix. Now the the only problem then is I'm gonna get digital samples of everything. Like they're gonna they're gonna lay it all out before you go to mass production. They're gonna like send you everything as if it's laid out to go into the printing machine. So I'm gonna get like these massive spreadsheets that take up like uh, forty gigs just to run the damn file for uh, and. In it, I'll be able to see all of what th what the components are going to look like. But the problem is, is even if you change a little thing, even if it's something like the colors, let's say, of the life counter, you still run the risk of, because you never saw it physically, you still run the risk of something getting mucked up along the way. And you would think, like, well, what can really change? You're just changing the colors of the freaking numbers on the life counter. That What could go wrong? Trust me, a change like that can cause things to go wrong. I mean, because the, the printer, they're people too. You know, in, in one change of a file, they change one thing in a file and accidentally, you know, screw something up with another file in that same folder. And the next thing you know, you get a card like rank five of Lunan and Testament where you've got nothing on the card. You've got no text on the card. What? Um, so I get a little worried about that. Av said, oh, sweet. Are we getting GNG earlier than expected considering the pushback? No, no. I mean, you'll still be getting gun and gun pretty close to when I said, you know, I talked about July this summer being when you get it. So you're going to get it. Then I'm not pushing. If anything, I would be slowing things down if I've if I didn't feel confident about them based on testament, uh, I wouldn't be pushing things through or anything like that. I don't know if that's what you meant, but um, you, you'll be getting them. You'll be getting gun and gun pretty much right when I said you would, when I revised the delivery date. Let's see here. What did I miss? Always more add-ons. Our life counters add-ons are come with the regular set. They come with the regular set. So everything you saw in that box right there comes with the regular set, not the jumbo card, obviously. Everything else in there, that comes with every set of the game. Um, that's what will be available on our web store and at retail. Life counters. The manga. The two rule books. The player aids. I do not have the play mats. So I did not um, ask for second rounds of proofs for the, uh, for the play mats because all that was wrong with the play mats were two things. One is they sent me square edged um, play mats. And I said, no, 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 no. No, thanks. Round that shit. <laughs> and there was, there was some ghosting that happened. Um, there was some ghosting that happened with the gun and gun logo that we figured out why that was. Uh, and they were like, yeah, um, we can send you another round, um, but it's going to be like 250 bucks to send you one of them. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> what? Uh, so there you have it. Okay, so that's Gun and Gun. So now I got a mess behind me. Half in the chat says, so box 001, huh? Let's see how high the number can go. Yeah, let's, let's see. Like I've said. As long as there's demand, as long as it makes financial sense to continue to produce gun and gun, and as long as Keep Dry wants to keep making the game, we are in it for the long haul. Lastly, uh, well, not lastly, I'm so used to only having four projects to give updates on. Oh my God, I'm coming up on two hours. 
Embryo Machine. Comfy in the chat says, I will always want more gun and gun. I will always want to localize more gun and gun. I just will. That game is hits me in a way that our other games do not. Although each game I sort of have a special attachment to, I suppose. Embryo Machine. So we are going to be updating the Embryo Machine tabletop simulator version over the weekend, adding in the two new Embryo Machines, which we'll be announcing later this week, which ones won the poll, fixing a couple bugs that were there, like the cards endlessly falling through the table in the bottom of the screen, fixing those things, um, adding the two new Embryo Machines pre-built decks, so you'll have four Embryo Machine units, four decks, and hopefully a virtual table that doesn't eat your cards. On top of that, <laughs> Rogue in the chat said, you mean announcing the two winners plus four knees. On top of that news of Embryo Machine, we got our latest miniatures render. I'm going to throw that up on the screen right now. So this one was Tortahan. I want to show you how this turned out. Uh, this model is... I'm going to move my screen over here, so I'm going to look away from the camera for a minute so I can look at this as well. Up here in the top right corner. This model... Shit. I'll tell you what. Uh, Frank, we're not announcing the two winners until the end of this week. So we'll be announcing that on, uh, on Friday. So here's Tour de Han, a side angle. I'll tell you what, this model is something else. This model is next level. Uh, all, of, all of Embryo's models feel sort of next level, which speaks to the strength of their design. They truly don't look like really any other mechs anywhere in, in any medium. I mean, I'm sure someone will point like, oh, well, it looks like that one mech from that one anime that no one's watched. Like, all right, touche. But um, I can't remember seeing many anim anime with, with mechs that have blades, giant curved blades for wings. Not in this capacity and not with this setup. Half in the chat said this model looks sick. Capital sick. Yes, it does. Let's look at another angle. All right. There it is from the opposite side. We get a nice cannon up there. I love that cannon. Backside. I'm always, I'm always infinitely intrigued with the backsides of these models just because we have to create them from scratch. And like the, the renderer is just having to get really creative with what the underside of all of these mechs look like. And it seems like every time we do another we do another embryo machine render, it's like it's harder than the last. It's like how how can the backside and the underside of uh, of a model get more complicated than Arachne? Oh, and then we introduce Tortahan. It's like oh okay, well how, how could how could it ever get more complicated than this? We've we have seen none of this on any of the on any of the models. So again, this is just like freestyling what we think the back of this of this embryo machine unit would look like. And then there is just a, a full on view front shot uh, to show the wingspan, the blade span of Tordon. This is, you know, these renders have just, um, have just turned out better than, <laughs> I think better than I was expecting. I mean, I, before I hired the guy who's doing all of these models, he showed me his portfolio and I'm like, there's a reason why I hired him. Right. I'm like, I'm, this is great. I'm really impressed. Your work is fantastic. Cool. You're the one I think you're going to do good with, with the material you've got. And then he started producing when he produced. It's like, all right. So I was expecting good. I wasn't expecting how good I wasn't expecting Tortahan levels of good. So, uh, this is exciting. Uh, Dark Soccer said, "Amazing job modeling that back." Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he. I mean, he killed it. It just, he just killed it. 
Frank in the chat said, would you care if anyone sold them printed to me? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know, Frank. I'm not going to talk about that on stream. <laughs> um, whatever you got to do to get them, right? So that's Embryo Machine. It's coming along well. And uh, we're, we're finishing up the implementation. We're still waiting on that map. I know I've said that for like three weeks now, but like it's true. We're still waiting on the illustration of the stretch goal map, which I'm not like worried because that requires literally no work from us. When it is given to us, all the work is done. We just slide it into the folder uh, with the DTP files and that's that. Uh, so it's like the last thing on my mind, though I am just like very anxious to see it because I know that some of the scenario play revolves around that new map, and that new map is unlike any, certainly unlike any of the other maps that come in the, in this first game. But knowing what maps come in the Throne and Border expansion and then the Gifted expansion, there's no map like it there either. Now it's not like the Gifted multi-tiered waterfall map. It's it's not like it's not like that because that thing is next level awesome, uh, but it is it is cool. Um, it deals with some interior stuff. A lot of embryo machine takes place in fields, you know, amidst the grassy plains. So to have something that takes place inside uh, something is is a really cool diversity that we're able to add to the game. So um, so I was saying. We are uh, finishing up our DTP conversions, or um, our, our final asset conversions. Once I get those, I'll go through them all with the editor. We'll give them a look over to make sure everything looks the way that it looks. I'm sure we'll find something to change at that point, but that's the great part about being six months ahead of schedule, five months ahead of schedule. Um, well, maybe not five months. That's actually not true, because that would... But we are probably two months ahead of schedule, which is which is cool. It gives us a lot of time to polish if we want to polish anything. Although I think Embryo is in a pretty polished state right now, so I don't suspect we'll spend a lot of time polishing. Okay, and then lastly, Made Night Saga. I don't have any additional details to share about Made Night Saga right now, other than to say we're going to be sharing more details about it in the coming weeks. So, um, and I, I will say that we're excited to share more details about it. It's a great game and it's unlike anything that we've done so far. It's a really cool game. Really, really cool. Everyone that I've shown it to has been like, I would play that game. Like even people that don't either typically play our stuff or play board games very much. I, I always want to hear from those folks just as much as I want to hear from folks who would naturally gravitate toward a game like that because those folks are going to give you feedback. You're not going to get from someone else who is like into that stuff. So it's always a good test to put it in front of those folks. So to put it in front of those folks and for them to come back and say like, this is actually really cool. Um, that like, that's really exciting. I mean, it's always exciting when like you're intended audience your intended demographic is like yes because then it's like yes <laughs> like cool validation we wanted from like our main folks that yes but it is also nice like your non-main folks to say like yo i don't typically like play your stuff but this shit's cool <laughs> it's like all right cool cool we're we're on the right track with this one you know that's the worst part about my approach with like just localizing games that I want to play is I am never quite sure if other people want to play them. I assume there are people out there who want to play them. So with Made Night Saga to get the feedback that we've gotten is very, yeah, it's very reassuring. And that's it. We've been recording for one hour and 54 minutes. I had half the number of questions and still talk just as long as last week. What am I doing with my life? Better yet, better yet, what are you all doing with your lives? You're still in here with me. You're crazy. You're crazy. No, it's awesome. Thank you so much. I love when, when you guys uh, join me live. It's so much 
more interesting to be able to read stuff in real time and get questions and feedback in real time. Um, someone in the chat said, I'm not a made type of player, but hope the Kickstarter will change my mind. I hope you will give it an opportunity to change your mind. Cause I do think that yes, the subject matter is maids, the gameplay, not matey. Um, Gameplay is just a really cool, like, school life simulator, um, character growth simulator. And even though it takes, it's centered around maids, they're not, I mean, they are maids, but they're knights, you know, that they are, they're like elite, essentially elite soldiers that come in the form of maids, um, and so to work that element into the gameplay itself, especially with the Battle for London expansion, how you get that more, you bring in that new theme of com of like direct combat, that kind of thing. Just, damn, that's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Mox said uh, they're sleeving Testament throughout the stream. Yeah, well, I mean, there's enough cards in there. Um, just send Rogue copy. Just send Rogue's copy uh, with a blank spot where it says May. It's just a night song. Yeah, I'll just put a, a piece of like duct tape over the <laughs> made part. I like that idea, Sid. Um, damn, he said combat, getting closer to me getting on board. Yeah, so I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like card combat necessarily. Again, the expansion implements into the base game. But um, you're definitely having to save London from an invading force. And in fact, the force has already invaded London. You're actually taking back London from this invading force. While also having to balance your school life of going to lectures and your part-time job and attending you know, your extracurricular activities and just keeping up with all the things that you would have to keep up with as a student at a university as you're trying to also prepare for your licensure exam to become a provisional maid knight, so eventually you can become a fully fledged maid knight. And then, yeah, you got to work in like, oh, and by the way, we got to save London from this invading force too. And, and so that dichotomy plays out in the actual gameplay. You've got to figure out how you're going to balance all of this stuff in play because it's up to you of how you do that. And all of those decisions that you make along the way about like what you're going to focus on and what you're going to not focus on what you're going to neglect is ultimately going to shape how your character grows over the course of the game, which then either helps or hinders your ability to claim victory points, which at the end of the day, the name of the game is victory points and the player with the most victory points wins. So it's like, but how you claim those victory points is really going to depend on the style um, and the stats of your character that you raise. Uh, because if you're like really wisdom heavy, but you're not very strength heavy in terms of growing that portion of your student, well, that's going to require you to tackle objectives throughout the game in a very different way than someone who put a lot of effort into raising their strength, but maybe not their wisdom so much. So you know, all of all of that stuff really plays into like what the actual game offers gameplay wise. And that's the, that's why I love the game so much. And it's so intuitive. The fact that the game has no text on the cards was such a huge selling point for me. Um, coming from all the games that we've come from where there's a ton of text on the cards to get just symbols on a card was very intuitive and very refreshing. And so um, it's nice to have a game that's not overwhelming and it, and just feels very natural. And I think that speaks to why the, the rule book in the game is pretty light compared to like what you're actually doing in the game. The rule books is the rule book is intuitive and it's accessible, but the gameplay itself is just accessible. Um, yeah, there's nuance and all of that. There's depth to it, but how it's presented and how you engage with it just feels very fluid. I love that. I love that. All right. What did I miss here? Uh, Go to War to Save London, but don't forget your cooking class tonight. That's right. I mean, that's these are the decisions. These are the things you have to worry about as a main knight in training. 
you sell this more and more every week, even though it's similar information and just more and more hype. Yeah. 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 I'm bad at school. Simulating going to class scares me. Yeah. Don't worry. I was too. We're going to get May Night sequel where you bring in characters you've successfully made provision on May Nights after they've graduated. Ah, I don't know. I, I do know that. So Laugh Sketch, the Japanese design studio behind May Night Saga, uh, this property, they have, they have three properties altogether. This is kind of like their main one. This is the world that they plan to do more with. Because I remember asking them, like, hey, can we drop the, the, the story of Faltitia from the, the base game? And he was like, no, that needs to stay there. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no, right on. Uh, just can you let me know why, just so I know? Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, the, I, I plan on doing more with this game, and that subtitle needs to be there. I'm like, okay, good enough for me. Uh, so I do think that there's more in store for the land of Faltitia. Okay, so I said I was going to get out of here. That was six minutes ago. I'm actually going to get out of here now. Uh, it's been a pleasure, everyone, to hang out with you tonight for the last two hours. Thanks for listening to me ramble, answer questions, get project updates. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, I appreciated everyone joining and talking in the chat, asking me questions, submitting questions. Keep it up. I love answering your alls questions. And uh, I'll keep producing uh, this show and giving you updates on our projects and where we're at. And we got some cool stuff planned for not only, you know, the summer Kickstarter, but then also the fall Kickstarter. And then also uh, early... 2022 Kickstarter and summer 2022 Kickstarter. <laughs> we got cool stuff. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Take care.